I'm going to be talking to you today about burnout and hopefully be uh, offering some practical tips that you can take home with you. I think that regardless of what your focus is in clinical practice, much of this should be relevant. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are urologists? Any advanced practice providers in the audience? Okay, great. And I, again, I think this is relevant not only for APPs, but also for uh, other support staff in your clinic. These are my disclosures. And these are the objectives. We're going to talk about the phenomenon itself as it relates to not just urologists, but to anyone in the room. We'll outline some threats to wellness for physicians and for everyone working with us in the clinical environment and discuss some ways to make us more efficient in what we do and to strive for that work-life balance. So if you ask most people what they want in life, they want to be happy, okay? And I would say that excitement is a practical synonym for happiness. We're very fortunate to have the type of career that we have, right? Because we're in demand and medicine is exciting. It's interesting. We have the opportunity to stay challenged and to continue to learn throughout our career. And a great degree of personal satisfaction can be derived from making a positive impact in the lives of our patients. So what is burnout? Well, if you just think about it literally, what was once full of energy has gone out, has been extinguished. In terms of what we're discussing, it's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, where you've lost your enthusiasm for work. Maybe you're driving in in the mornings more often than not, and you're not looking forward to it. You're thinking, ugh, oh, another day of these cases, or ugh, oh, this patient's coming back today. But the concept of depersonalization, so perhaps Mr. Thompson, the tobacco farmer from you know, North Carolina that you've known for a few years is now just uh, the BPH case or the post-op case in room three, and you're trying to think about how you can get them out of the office more quickly today. But ultimately, this can translate into decreased effectiveness in what we do. Now, there are a number of threats to our wellness on any day, okay? The culture's changed. Uh, it's become more uh, competitive and some would say more frantic and desperate. We're constantly being asked to do more with less less resources, but with more requirements placed upon us, more scrutiny, perhaps more risk, more medical legal concerns. And patients have higher demands, or so, so it seems. And we're being asked to address Prescani scores, online reviews, uh, and this is coming uh, at us from multiple angles. Based on published research, it appears that the interval of 10 to 20 years after entering practice is particularly stressful for physicians. And it's not just going to affect uh, performance at work. Certainly at work, right, and what we do day to, day to day, it can result in medical errors, decrease patient satisfaction, and even increase physician turnover, people deciding to just leave practice altogether. But it can also affect your personal life, right? It can translate into your relationships with other people, it can re result in self-destructive behavior, depression, and in severe cases, even suicide. So Urology Times did a nice comprehensive survey back in 2017, just over 250 providers, urologists and urology residents had responded, and just over 40% had reported being burned out, and almost a third felt that they were headed that way. And that's not an ins insignificant number. Other surveys have come out of Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, showing similar findings. So what were the reasons that they cited? Well, one of the biggest ones has been EMR, right? Increased need for documentation. Cleveland Clinic has devoted a lot of research, and uh, the American College of Surgeons uh, is heavily invested in, in this as well. But workload has been cited, changes in revenue and overhead, uh, paperwork, prior authorizations, uh, hanging on the phone, waiting for somebody to approve what you're trying to get done for your patient, and then feeling that patients are less appreciative and that they have unreasonable expectations. Okay? Let me move forward. So how important is it? Well, burnout was cited as the number one factor influencing plans for when to time your retirement. Other factors included regulation from outside groups, changes in reimbursement, and some of the other things we just spoke about, but those could just be surrogate markers for the overall phenomenon. Over 20% of the respondents in that survey were considering joining a hospital or a larger group to lessen administrative hassles and in, uh, in an attempt to achieve better reimbursement and more free time. So I'm not a psychologist, right? I'm not a psychiatrist. Why should you listen to me? So um, I had the opportunity to meet Paul Harvey uh, at one uh, point in my education, and some of you may be old enough to remember who he was, uh, a famous radio man that my grandfather was a big fan of. And I just loved his voice, and I loved his approach to things, and I said to him, I said, Mr. Harvey, what's the, the key to giving a great lecture? And he says, nobody wants to hear a lecture. 
So people like to hear stories. Tell them a story. So I grew up in Detroit. So south of Detroit, well below the poverty line. So people had very low expectations for me. So I had a big chip on my shoulder to kind of prove what I was capable of as I came up through my education. And so uh, once I got into uh, medical school, um, I started dating the landlady. Uh, she rented out the lower half of a duplex. She was also in my class. She's walking around the building here somewhere. And uh, by the second year, I was engaged. Third year, I was married. Fourth year, a week before graduation, I had my first child. And then I had another child every other year, up to a total of four, the ones you see in the picture. And then we were both in residency. And after residency, I went on to do two separate fellowships and then joined a, a department that was being head, or it's still head by a chairman who prioritizes academic output. And I wouldn't say no to anything. You know, I was determined to prove that I was capable of, of, of doing this at a very high level. And so when I would come home at night, I was still working much to the detriment of the relations with the people around me. And so eventually it became clear that I had to do something, I had to make a decision. And despite the ego and the environment I was raised in, I eventually agreed to talk to a counselor. And uh, that was kind of a big deal, but he taught me some very important things. But he also taught me that divorce was inevitable, but not divorce from my wife, divorce from my behaviors and my way of thinking. And so as such, I started to make some changes, and I got, to my, I got myself to where I felt I was in a very comfortable place. And after doing the AUA leadership program, I met with Paul Maroney, and we talked about our experiences, and we agreed to put together a course that we've been teaching, and this will be the second year at the AUA. So I continue to be busy, but uh, hopefully some of what I've gained can be helpful to you as well. So data shows that the more time you spend in pr uh, practice, the greater the degree of depersonalization and emotional exhaustion. We have scoring systems for these, and as, you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, a big component of what we define as burnout. It also appears that those in private practice tend to work more hours. So what do they do in response? Well, follow-up studies have shown that when this starts to happen, people tend to respond, providers tend to respond by scaling back, and that tends to work, right? It's effective, right? But there, there's challenges with that as well. So what's the problem with working less? Well, there's a physician shortage, right? People always fear working less, and they're worried about economic uh, factors. I was actually approached by the NCCN once they heard that we were teaching this course, and they asked if we would you know, teach a webinar. And I, I said, yeah, this sounds great. I'm excited that you called us. I'm happy to do this. They said, OK, we're going to be speaking to hospital administrators from 20-some member hospitals. So, in the course of this hour-long phone call, we're getting towards the end, and I'm talking about some strategies and talking about scaling back you know, your clinical volumes until you can get things under control, and they just stopped it. They said, whoa, you can't say anything like that. You can't say anything about seeing less patients. Absolutely not. And they shut it down. Never called me again. So <laughs> there's thus a need to address the drivers, right? The amount of work that you're being asked to do, inefficiencies in the practice environment, uh, physicians increasingly want more control and flexibility, and they want to feel that their work is meaningful. All right? So I'm a big fan of Mike Rowe, um, and, you know, one of the things that I was taught growing up is that, you know, hard work can be its own reward. It's, it's not the problem, working hard. But we need to reduce menial tasks that don't provide fulfillment, and it's always important to consider a team approach. So I grew up in Michigan. My grandfather was uh, an immigrant. Uh, I dropped out in eighth grade, but you know he loved college sports and he rooted for the state school, which you know I was raised to be a Michigan fan. And so uh, when I was a kid, Bo Schembechler would take the field for the, uh, the football and uh, always emphasize the team. And this is a quote from him, and it says that no man's more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. And if we think that way, all of us, everything that you do, you take into consideration, what effect does it have on my team? And so when we think about our team, when I think about mine on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinic, I have a lot of people working with me. And whereas before I was very focused on just what I had to do that day, I've taken a step back to kind of realize uh, the need to incorporate them. And you want to empower your team members to perform. I can't tell you how quickly the performance goes up when you begin to uh, empower them with different responsibilities. It seems that, like they get smarter on the spot. And titles can certainly convey value, so don't underestimate that. Uh, if you have things that you do over and over again, we're going to talk about algorithms. You want to automate what you can and eliminate a decision bottleneck for things that are non-fatal if misperformed, meaning not everything should have to come to you, okay? And so and you want to don't, well, you want to remember, excuse me, to say thank you. 
all right? You don't want the people working with you to burn out either. Well, maybe your team is a group of physicians below you. Maybe you're in leadership. Well, more research is being devoted to strategies there as well about cultivating a culture uh, at work and strengthening the people that work uh, with you, alongside you, to give them a greater sense of control and value. So some tips for operational efficiency that you can hopefully employ if you're not already doing so to the fullest uh, extent possible. Um, one of which I really enjoy is dynamic scheduling. What I mean by this is uh, trying to figure out what's going to optimize your workflow in the course of a day. So I'll give you an example. On Friday mornings I do procedures. Uh, I might do some vasectomies, maybe some cystos, every once in a while a prostate biopsy, although I try to shunt those to some of my other partners. But I know in the time that it takes my support staff to take that vasectomy patient after I go in the block and prep them and get them ready, I can go remove two stents for the transplant team because they'll send those patients to my office. So I'll book them at the same time slot. Right? And then I start to look at what visits are quick post-op from this you know, versus a new discussion of malignancy. And then if you're going to have a, a, a visit that's going to take a lot of your time in the room, that's when the nurses might want to go do some of their nurse clinic installations and things of that sort. So try to get a sense of flow and try to optimize that. You want to be efficient with your EMR. We're on Epic now, and I know that about 30% of providers or urologists in the country are on the same system. But take advantage of all your smart phrases and you know, pre-populated templates, not just for op notes, for clinic notes. And try to do this for different chief complaints. Again, make it as, a, uh, as streamlined as possible. I actually schedule calls from my staff to patients, pre-op and post-op. And I found that this has reduced unplanned utilization of resources, coming into the clinic for things, going into the ER for questions that they didn't need to be addressed in the ER. Uh, it reduces cancellations to make sure they're complying with pre-op instructions. You can get a sense sometimes having a conversation with a man in the office uh, that they might not remember you know, what to do, what to take, what not to take. You want to get paid for what you do. You're, do you're putting in a lot of effort. Make sure you're not leaving money on the table. Work with your coders and billing team. Embrace quality improvement. Don't just look at this as, ah, oh, it's that conference again, or ah, oh, you know, this is being uh, placed upon my shoulders by uh, the higher ups. It's, it's going to make your life better. I don't use scribes, but uh, I have a number of friends that uh, find this to be a powerful addition to their practice. If it's something that makes sense for you, certainly investigate it. And consider increasing your support staff if you're busy enough to warrant it, or if you're feeling burdened. Okay, people look at this as a cost, but if it leads to better quality of life for you and better outcomes in your practice, eventually it translates and makes up for the, uh, for the cost involved. Before you delegate something to somebody else, decide if it needs to be done at all. Okay, so never automate what can be eliminated and never delegate what can be automated or streamlined. So this came out towards the end of this past year in New England Journal of Medicine. I believe this was out of Hawaii. And the title really caught my eye, Getting Rid of Stupid Stuff. So what they did is this group approached their employees and they asked them to nominate items in the electronic health record that they felt were poorly designed, unnecessary, or just plain stupid. And this included documentation that was never meant to occur, that which was needed but was inefficient or needed and uh, poorly understood. And they found that one unnecessary click across their institution had consumed 1,700 nursing hours per month. OK? So there's a lot of opportunity there to get better. Our uh, hospital has a program, uh, a course on patient-centered communication. And I know a few other universities are doing this as well. But trying to figure out how can we get patients through the office in a reasonable amount of time, but not having them feel rushed and having them feel that they got their value out of that time with you. So you want to learn to establish rapport quickly, find that balance of open and closed questions, and cut down on perceived wait time. So if you're wanting to keep your rooms available for physician to patient clinical interaction, figure out if you, know, you need a vital station. Right? Keep the patient moving. Don't allow them to sit in one place for too long. If, they have, if you have the opportunity to let them enter either on paper or perhaps digitally their intake information, specifically if it's related to their chief complaint. So if you know why they're coming and it pre-populates the questions that you would normally want answered, it can make your visit go a lot more quickly, okay? Uh, Pre-visit mailers can accomplish the same thing. A number of our uh, providers at our hospital will send these out in advance, uh, introduce themselves to the patient, and get the information sent back. I enjoy dictating in the room, right in front of the patient. 
I have those little microphones attached to the computer, and so that way I'm not typing you know, in front of them. I have this conversation, and then it tends to validate for them the information that I've taken, that I've learned so much about them in a short amount of time, I get that chart done before I go to the next room. So you've probably heard if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Well, that's fine if you're the person who wants something done. It's not always so great if you're the busy person. Okay, so you may be facing increased demands. Can you take an additional patient or two on your clinic schedule today? Can you review this paper or chair this committee? Can you provide this, the medical student lecture for this block? All right, and this comes up a lot in my day to day. So as I mentioned, I learned something, learned a few things actually from going to see the counselor, right? One of which was learning how to say no, which I've always been pretty bad at. And so what I've learned to say, and this has really been a life changer for me, is that doesn't work for me. But what would work for me is this, and please let me know if that's a possibility, all right? I've always been a big fan of uh, asking for forgiveness rather than permission. I find that that allows you to move forward and to be productive. Um, but you also need to train those people around you with your responses to know that your time's important, but that you know, you're willing to work within certain boundaries. I tell my kids all the time that brevity is the key to communication. I tell my residents the same thing, especially if they're calling me at 3 in the morning. Um, but my wife's also taught me that listening takes practice and needs to be an active exercise, okay? Um, Gordon McClory, who was a mentor and former colleague, uh, told me uh, once as well that it doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth and how nice you think it sounds if your eyebrows are telling people to take a hike. So be mindful of your body language as well. <laughs> Tim Ferriss, who wrote The 4-Hour Workweek, it's a great book if you haven't read it, uh, said, being busy is a form of laziness, lazy thinking and indiscriminate action. I fully believe that, okay? And so uh, something I learned growing up in an outdoors family and in the Army as well was that to aim small, miss small. Keep your focus tight, and you're not going to miss by much. So consider dialing back the number of patients if you are feeling you're overwhelmed, okay? And then cr increasing the availability if you find, oh, I'm not having more time between visits. I feel like, you know, we got this under better control. And do what's in your comfort zone. Our paper uh, was called the TERP study, Trends in Neurologic Referral Patterns. This is what uh, won the AUA Leadership Program. We published this in Neurology Practice. And it shows an increasing trend towards subspecialization within groups and kind of referring uh, more complex cases out to centers of excellence or to people that do a high volume of this. So consider that if that tends to be an issue for you. And you have to customize because it's not one size fits all. If you're not familiar with the low information diet, I, I find this also to be very helpful. Uh, I've learned the do not disturb icon, this little half moon on my iPhone. It's been a life changer for me. I think I walked away from checking Facebook about eight months ago. Uh, I, I think this has also been helpful. A lot of what's coming at you on news uh, feeds is not necessarily relevant to your day to day. Learn to be a quitter. So, or a non-finisher, this is also very difficult for me, but if the article stinks, stop reading it. If the movie's terrible, walk out, and the meal's bad, stop eating. Although my mom was a very big finisher plate kind of person, which is probably why I was so heavy when I graduated high school. Um, doing something unimportant well doesn't make it important. Similarly, if it takes a lot of time, that doesn't make it important. I'm not a believer in to-do lists. I used to be. I used to have post-its all over the place. But now I use my calendar. Schedule a time. Devote that time. Commit to getting something done, okay? Avoid meetings that can be summarized in a text message, and if necessary, set an end time for the meeting, all right? Already talked about the value of brevity, and, you know, putting things on the back burner just gets to add up and add up. Dave Barry, you know, had the similar uh, feelings about meetings. Um, so, again, I, I agree with him. I think that they're oftentimes highly self-indulgent. Email, a lot of us are probably plagued by email. Um, this, one of Tim Ferriss' uh, suggestions, at least for him, was to devote certain times to checking email, rather than having it come to your phone left and right, left and right, beeping and buzzing in your phone. I mean, I can feel vibrations even when I don't have my phone on me. I mean, that's how bad it got for me. Uh, but this is not practical for everybody. But uh, consider it if it is something that you can employ. Uh, respond to voicemails with an email and use an if-then statement, almost like you were doing a computer program. But this limits the number of back and forth emails and exchanges, so people can say, well, all right, it's not that, I'm going to go ahead with this. And then if you want to reserve your phone call for just urgent needs, especially if you have other things going on, you need to train people appropriately that that's only for those types of matters. And then when you answer the phone, get right to the point. 
Strategies, I would tell you that batching has been helpful for me. I used to be in the clinic and between patient visits, click over to the in-basket and see, oh, something else in black bold print I had to address. Now I just do that at a specific time so I can get a lot done at once. I want to try to have my most important task done by 11 a.m. and to prevent work for work's sake, but also schedule time for yourself. Remember, it's a great job we have. It's an amazing opportunity and you want to retain wonderment and realize that patients are not the only ones with unrealistic expectations. This has always been and will continue to be a customer service field, okay? Consumers change, disease management changes, technology changes. I find that I was getting to the point where I was complaining more often, and now I, I recognize that my time abroad really serves as a perspective reset. I spend a week in India each year, and I go to a few other places as well, and I see people so passionate about helping other people, even in the setting of limited resources, that when I come back, I realize that what I thought were problems aren't really big problems at all. Try to find a daily routine that works for you. I don't do yoga. I have a number of friends that do, but it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing or another. Uh, mindfulness and meditation, again, there's a lot of science behind it, uh, can be helpful for some people but learn to embrace monotasking and not feeling like you have to do so much at once. And remember, if you find yourself getting angry, it's your own fault, okay? And that's an important concept. Will Bowen uh, came up with a complaint-free challenge. I started this today. Basically, you try to go 21 days without complaining, and then you have to switch the bracelet to the other wrist each time you do. I'll let you read about that online. And then uh, all of these will be posted online for you. But in conclusion, uh, we want to simplify these issues. Focus on yourself, focus on your practice, and avoid burning out. Thank you very much.